Hey everyone, Nigel and Luke here, and welcome to Crime Zone. College and university dormitories tend to be associated with positive experiences. Things like meeting new people, throwing fun parties, and getting that first taste of independent living away from home. However, like any place that becomes sufficiently romanticized in popular culture, it can be easy to overlook some of the darker events that have taken place in college dorms over the years. While many of these things, like self-harm and sexual assault, are subjects that have increasingly garnered public attention and awareness over time, in rare circumstances, college dorms have been the sites of some truly chilling crimes. Today, we wanted to take a look at two cases like this, focusing on stories of tragic murders that took place in college dorms. Before we get to the videos, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this. It really helps us to continue building the channel. And if you've watched a few of our videos already, you might not even realize that you're not subscribed. While you're there, don't forget to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. With that out of the way, here is part one of two chilling cases that took place in college dormitories. At approximately 8 a.m. on the morning of May 28, 1995, residents of Harvard University's Dunster House were awoken to the sounds of terrifying screams. The agonizing calls for help were coming from the dormitory's second floor, outside of a room shared by two promising young pre-med students. When help arrived a short time later, both women would be found dead inside of the dorm room. One from a series of horrifying stab wounds, the other asphyxiated and hanging in the bathroom shower stall. The tragedy would cause significant controversy at Harvard, and still leaves a haunting legacy on the university's campus to this day. Sinidu Tedese and Trang Ho met when they became roommates in their second year at Harvard. Considering how far apart their lives had started, both geographically and culturally, they seemed to be on a remarkably similar trajectory when their lives became intertwined. Both women were immigrants who had experienced turbulent political situations in their home countries growing up. Trang had escaped Vietnam as a refugee with her father, while Sinidu had witnessed her own father serve time as a political prisoner in Ethiopia during the rule of its communist military dictatorship. Sinidu and Trang had excelled academically in their youth and teenage years with Sinidu receiving a scholarship to Ethiopia's International Community School and Trang attending Boston Technical High School. Both were their high school's valedictorians and were admitted to Harvard on full scholarships. At the time that they became roommates, they were in pre-med programs and each had their sights set on Harvard Medical School after finishing their undergraduate degrees. However, the similarities between the two aspiring doctors deviated starkly when it came to their respective social lives. Though both were described by many as quiet, polite, and studious, Trang had many friends with whom she could let her full personality shine. This was especially true of the small group of Vietnamese friends that she had made on campus and elsewhere, who knew Trang to be friendly, kind, and even fairly outgoing in the right company. Trang was also close with her family, who she left campus almost every week to visit in nearby Medford, Massachusetts. Sinidu, on the other hand, had always struggled to make social connections. This was true even in Ethiopia, where she had few, if any, friends in school. Things had only gotten worse when she had arrived at university, as she was now isolated from her family as well, who she would only visit once during her entire time at Harvard due to financial reasons. She likewise failed to create any meaningful connection with the few relatives she had in the U.S., even though they lived relatively close to the school. In her desperation, Sinidu had taken to sending dozens of letters to strangers that she picked randomly from the phone book, asking if they would be her friends. At first, when the pair moved in together, it seemed like things might finally be turning around for Sinidu. Trang was someone who not only shared similar experiences to her, but who understood the enormous pressure of attending a school like Harvard, as well as the need to make her family proud. Their second year of school soon passed, and by all appearances, it seemed like they were getting along. 
However, by junior year, things were beginning to unravel. It started with small things, such as arguments over the cleanliness and noise in their shared room. But as time went on, it became far more about their relationship itself. Because Sinadu had few social connections at school outside of her relationship with her roommate, she began to latch on to Trang and became increasingly needy for her attention. Those who knew Trang would later say that she was getting frustrated and started to spend less time around her dorm room as a result. Still, she avoided addressing her frustrations with Sinadu directly, a consequence both of her excessive politeness as well as a concern for how she might react. At the same time, neither student was doing as well as they would have liked in their studies. Though they had been academic stars at their respective high schools, the level of competition at Harvard was a different thing entirely, and both struggled to maintain the extremely high grades that they were accustomed to. This was especially true of Sinadu, who managed to achieve a respectable B average, but knew she was falling short of what it would take to get into Harvard Medical School. Trang's grades were slightly higher in the B-plus to A-minus range, but her outcome appeared similar. This was hammered home by biology professor and master of Dunster House, Corel Liem, who also served as both women's academic advisor. Liem would later tell reporters that he had met with Sinadu and Trang separately towards the end of their junior year, informing them that they likely wouldn't make it into Harvard Medical School with their grades, but that they could easily get into other, very good schools. In April, with just over a month left in the academic year, Trang finally told Sinadu that she had made different arrangements for the following year. She planned to move out of their dorm room and in with a different roommate. To say that this was a blow to Sinadu would be a severe understatement. For the next month, she became despondent and even more withdrawn than usual refusing to even speak to Trang during their final weeks together. In a letter, Sinadu wrote to Trang, quote, I thought we were going to do stuff together. You'll always have a family to go to, and I am going to have no one. For her part, Trang tried her best to avoid their shared space as much as possible, spending extra time in the library and staying out late into the night. Though things between the two roommates were bad, no one was prepared for what came next. As the final week of exams drew to a close at the end of May of 1995, Sinadu's psychological state deteriorated even further. She obtained medical exemptions for two of her exams, failing to attend a third altogether, something that she had never before done in her life. She also purchased a large foldable hunting knife and a length of rope, and sent a photo of herself to the Harvard Crimson newspaper. A note included with the photo chillingly stated, Quote, keep this picture. There will soon be a very juicy story involving the person in this picture. On the morning of May 28th, Sinadu's alarm clock went off around 8 a.m. It was enough to wake up 26-year-old Tao Nguyen, a friend of Trang's who had been staying in their room with them the previous night. Nguyen would later tell police that the first thing she saw was Sinadu standing over Trang's bed, holding a knife, with what she described as a crazed expression on her face. After that, Sinadu began to stab Trang relentlessly. Though Nguyen attempted to intervene in the horrific attack, she was immediately stabbed as well and realized that the only thing she could do was try to get help as quickly as possible. She began to run through the halls of Dunster House screaming, finally ending up in the courtyard as she repeatedly yelled, someone killed my friend. It would soon be revealed that Trang suffered a total of 45 stab wounds in the fatal attack. Immediately after the assault, Sinadu barricaded herself in the bathroom and hung herself with a rope that she tied to the shower rod. By the time police could force their way in, both women were tragically dead. In the immediate aftermath of the grisly crime, all sides struggled to come to terms with what had happened. Both Trang and Sinadu had seemed destined for success two extremely bright young women with limitless potential and bright futures. In particular, no one that claimed to know Sinadu believed that she could be capable of such a heinous crime. Her family said that she had never shown any signs of aggressive or self-harming behavior, and said that she had always been a quiet but happy child. 
Her teachers at Harvard and those back in Ethiopia likewise exhibited shock and sadness at the news. Many went out of their way to talk about what a serious and hard-working person Sinadu had been throughout her academic career. The school's official position was also one of complete surprise. They claimed that they did not know there were any problems between Trang and Sinadu, and that they had no idea about Sinadu's drastic psychological decline. However, two years later, a book would be published that would attempt to shed additional light on the tragedy. The book was written by a former Harvard graduate and creative writing professor named Melanie Thernstrom and entitled Halfway Heaven, Diary of a Harvard Murder. In order to write the book, Thernstrom traveled to Ethiopia, where she was given access to Sinadu's diaries by her family. They proved to be a detailed window into the young woman's severe mental health issues, her extreme feelings of isolation, and her desperate search to find a friend or any form of meaningful social connection. Perhaps most heartbreaking of all, the diary seemed to reveal that Sinadu had never received the social belonging that she craved, even from her own family. Like many people in her life, it appeared that they spoke only of her academic achievements and never really took the time to get to know her personally or the issues that she was dealing with. However, the most excoriating part of the book concerned Harvard's handling of the case. Contrary to what the school had said in the aftermath of the crime, Thernstrom argued that there were clear warning signs. One of the letters that Sinadu had written back when she was trying to solicit friends from the phone book had been received by someone who was friends with an administrator at the university, who passed the letter on because of its disturbing content. That letter eventually made its way to the people in charge of the dorm where Sinadu lived, and it was read and filed, but nothing was ever done about it. Likewise, it appeared that Sinadu had reached out for help at the university's mental health center. To deal with the issue, the university provided her with counseling sessions once a month. Following the release of the book, Trang Ho's family sued Harvard, arguing that they could have done more to prevent her death. The lawsuit was apparently settled out of court, and we could find little information about it aside from reports of the lawsuit's original filing. Today, the haunting legacy of the case lives on, as controversy regarding mental health in higher education has only become a more frequent point of interest in recent years. However, regardless of your thoughts on the case, it's hard not to imagine how those two bright young lives might have turned out, if only things had gone differently. Do you know of any other cases like this that you think we should check out? Tell us about them in the comments section below. As always, if you enjoyed our video, don't forget to like and subscribe to Crime Zone for more true crime content like this, making sure to hit the notification bell to stay up to date with our latest releases. Thank you for watching.